Welcome everyone, good to see all of you. Uh, today we're welcoming Professor James A. Robinson, the Richard L. Person Professor, of, um, professor at the University of Chicago, uh, who is well known for his um, insights into prosperity, development and poverty. Um, and I believe he's going to be speaking for the first 10 minutes or so about um, his latest book with Darren Ashimoglu, um, The Narrow Corridor. Um, and just to remind everyone, if you have any questions, please feel free to send them in to me or to Freddie, and we'll make sure we get off. So, James. Okay, you. perfect. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, so, so, so let, me, let me, I'm going to have a go at talking about my new book, or our new book, for 10 minutes, which is, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough, it's a tough task, but, but, you know, but anyway, oh, okay, well, that still didn't work. Slideshow. Oh, no, it's this PowerPoint. I hate PowerPoint. Um, okay, this may, okay, my last effort before I shut up. Okay, there you go. So, so here's the, the it's called the narrow, co narrow corridor. This is a p egregious piece of uh, self-promotion here. But anyway, all the bookshops are closed, you know, so, so you can't go and browse it. Uh, so, so what's, you know, this, this book, you know, this book is a sort of sequel, I suppose you could say to why nations fail. Um, uh, and, you know, let me sort of explain what it's about in 10 minutes. It's really about sort of long run political dynamics in the world and why the, why different parts of the world are in such different kind of political equilibria. And, you know, here's a simple way of thinking about, uh, the book, you know, so, so, so think of two dimensions on the horizontal axis, you could say this is the sort of the power of society, you know, the ability of society to act collectively, identify collective goals, sort of cooperate, create organizations related to lots of ideas in social science, like the notion of social capital and things like that. So think the power of society and on the vertical axis, something probably easier to think about, which is the power of the state. So the power of the state to kind of regulate, control society, raise taxes, etc. Okay, so, so what I'm going to do, you know, for 10 minutes is just think about where different parts of the world are on this, in this space. Okay, so start by, by thinking about a society where the state is very powerful and society is weak. Okay, what comes to mind? Well, you know, if, if you ask me that question, I'd say China comes to mind. You know, China's a place with a very powerful state, which and a very weak society. It's not a society that's able to organize collectively to contest the power of the state or ask the state to do stuff. It's, it's almost prostate. So, and what's interesting about China, if you start thinking about China, is it's been like that for a long time. You know, if you go back to the writings of Confucius, Confucius said, you know, when describing the ideal political system a little bit aphoristically, commoners do not debate matters of government. Actually, he said something a little bit more complicated than that, which is in a state that follows the way. But I, I'm not going to advance uh, a, a theory of the way uh, in this 10 minutes. So, so I thought I'd just move, that, move along from the way, okay? Commoners do not debate matters of government. Right? And that's how it's been in China, you know, for the last two and a half thousand years. Uh, and one of the intellectual architects of that uh, Lord Shang, he also mentioned the way, but you know, here's, uh, here's a famous statement from his writings that have uh, come down to us. When the people are weak, the state is strong. Hence the state strives to weaken the people. Okay. So he's describing this strong state, weak people, you know, two and a half thousand years ago. So Lord Shang was an advisor to the Qin state during the Warring States period prior to the first uh, dynasty in China. He, he'd passed away by the time his philosophy got put into operation. He was one of several famous legalist philosophers who devised a scheme for how you organize society. The state is strong, strong state weakens the people. Okay. And you know, that goes all the way down to today. You know, here's Tiananmen Square, 1989. There's the weak person. There's the strong state with the tanks. And, you know, if you weren't locked down, but you could wander about in Beijing and Tiananmen Square today, you'd see, you know, thousands of these face recognition uh, cameras going up everywhere in 
China. So here's the latest version, you know, using modern technology of the strong state dominating society. Okay. But of course, it's, that's not the only configuration in the world. In fact, when you start thinking about it, there's other places which have almost the opposite configuration, where the society is strong, but the state is weak. What's an example of that? Yemen or Lebanon. You know? In Yemen, society is very powerful, very organized through clans and lineages, and, you know, and everyone is armed. You can see everyone has a dagger here. In fact, you, know, you, you, you Cambridge undergraduates, you, know, you all have at least the men. You know, it's, it's kind of organized, but in a sec rather sexist way. The men, you'd all have a dagger. You'd be sitting there at home watching me with your dagger, you know, at the ready, you know, because when you become a man, you get your dagger. You can see there's different sizes of daggers and the different sorts of daggers. And, you know, depending on which way you wear the dagger, you know, that's kind of significant. I won't go into all those details. But here's a situation where the state in Lebanon, you know, the, 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 even before the civil war started, the current civil war, the remit of the state never really extended much outside Sana, you know, outside it was society that controlled the autonomous of the state. It's interesting, Yemen, because, you know, if you studied um, some political philosophy or soci political sociology, you probably heard about this character, even economics. When I was an undergrad at the LSE, the first economics book I read was the Protestant, was Weber's, this is Max Weber, his, we read the Protestant ethic of the spirit of capitalism. You know, no wonder I'm so confused, if that's the first economics book you read. The second book I read was Keynes's General Theory, so, you know, like, confused squared. Anyway, here's a famous uh, definition of the state. We're talking about the state to Weber. What did Weber say, you know, in his famous essay? The state is that human community that successfully claims the monopoly of legitimate use of violence within a given territory. You know, what's interesting about a place like Yemen is it's not the state that has legitimate use of violence, it's society. Every man has a legitimate use of violence in Yemen and everyone is armed. So, so this is a, you know, that, and, you know that's, 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 that's a completely different configuration from China. And it's been like that for a long time, you know, so we actually know quite a lot going back a thousand, one and a half thousand years about what it was like in Yemen. And that, that organization of things has been very persistent. But obviously it's not, everything is not like that, you know. Uh, there's other types of situation in the world where, not where state dominates society or society dominates the state, but there's much more, there's much more balance, okay. And if I thought about, you know, Western Europe or North American society, I'd say there's much more balance between the state is weaker than in China, society is stronger. There's much more of a balance. OK, so if I was going to put this on the diagram, I might put it up there. And, you know, there's a very significant reason why it's up there, which implies that both the power of the state and the power of society is actually stronger. OK, and that's because, you know, in the book, our argument is there's this sort of catalytic interaction between state and society that when you achieve this balance you end up with both a stronger state and a stronger society so a lot of the book is sort of trying to look at the historical dynamics and ask how come you know different parts of the world ended up in such different equilibria okay and just to you know give you the one minute version of the western european story uh it's it goes back to the collapse. How did, the, how did Western European society end up with this kind of balance? You know, why didn't that happen in Yemen or China? And it goes back, you know, the way we tell it is, you know, to, to, to the collapse of the Western Roman Empire when the Franks took over what was left of Roman state institutions. And Clovis, you know, that great political engineer, I'm sure you all know about Clovis, uh, the head of the Franks, merged these very participatory kind of Germanic political institutions with late Roman state institutions, administrative institutions, the church, not, not so much the fiscal system, which kind of withered away. Uh, but, but, but he took that and it was a sort of merger of state and society. Okay. And it created a very different equilibrium, either from Yemen or China. You know, one thing that Pro Clovis did was he promulgated the Salic law. So here's a, you know, here's an existing, this is not from the time of Clovis, this is later, uh, but here's a, an existing preface, which I like very much. For men, it's a bit sexist too, chosen out of many, Wizogast, Arogast, Saligast, Widogast, it sounds like Lord of the Rings, 
came from beyond the Rhine, coming together in three legal assemblies and discussing the origins and cases carefully. So what's interesting about the Salic law, you compare this to existing Qin, you know, we don't, there's only fragments of the Qin legal code left, but, but what we know about that, it was this very top-down kind of micromanaging of society model. Clovis might have promulgated the Salic law, but actually he didn't even write it. It was written by three legal assemblies. It was this, and if you look at the Salic law, it was a codification of social norms and practices and, you know, feuding regulation. And, and so it was a very bottom up construction and it came from this particular equilibrium. And in the chapter on Europe, we try to tell, you know, this story and how it spreads. And since you're, you know, you're mostly sitting in England, I thought, you know, this is the, this is, you know, the, the Franks, but you know, what, it, you know, this model also spread from the Franks, it spread into large parts of Western Europe, it spread into, it spread into England, you know, so, so here's, you may have, some of you may have been to Runnymede, uh, Runnymede Meadow, where King John signed the Magna Carta somewhat reluctantly uh, in 1215 uh, with the barons. But what you may not know is like, why there? You know, why did he do it there? Well, you can see there was a nice pub in the background. So after they signed the Magna Carta, they went and had a drink in the pub. But, but, but actually, what's interesting about this, there's a very hyperbolic sign here, the birthplace of modern democracy. Uh, uh, but, but, but what's really interesting about Runnymede Meadow is that Runnymede Meadow was a place where the Witten, the Anglo-Saxon Witten met. So the Witten is a sort of direct version of these Germanic assemblies, you know, the same ones that put the Salic law together. It was the Anglo-Saxon version that came with the Saxons to England. And, you know, what, why do I show this? Well, to suggest that there's an awful lot of persistence uh, in this fusion of state and society this balance okay so just here's my last slide not my second to last slide you know so here's the you know here's the book in the diagram you know we're trying to, we're trying to provide a very simple way of kind of there's three bins you know if you think about different places today in the world and in history you can think of them their political dynamics in terms of this balance between uh state and uh, state and society, and the different kind of equilibria that, that give you. And in the middle, you know, between the state dominating society or society dominating the state, there's what we call the narrow corridor, you can see that in bold, hence the title of the book, where you get this balance between state and society. And it creates this particular dynamic that we call the red queen effect. I know there's lots of red queen effects, but anyway, so we try to, we, we try to kind of, grab this red queen effect idea. Uh, and, you know, and, and in some sense, you know, if you thought about why nations fail, what's the relationship between this and why nations fail? This is sort of explaining where, where, where inclusive political institutions come from, okay? That's, you know, and so what's the point of having a theory like this? Well, let me end with kind of one, you know, one, one final fact, which is, you know, here's the Brandenburg Gate, here's the Berlin Wall kind of falling down. So, so, you know, at the time the Berlin Wall fell down, there were all sorts of predictions about, you know, what was going to happen. It was, I, you know, I even remember, I'm old enough to remember it, you know. And, uh, and, and, and there was a famous claim by Francis Fukuyama that history was going to end and we were all going to converge to this sort of liberal democracy. Maybe there's two versions of that. One is a sort of positive claim that our institutions were all going to be like that. And another is a kind of more normative claim that this was the, the kind of only really, you know, legitimate set of political institutions. It's a, it's a very nutty idea, I always thought. I thought so at the time, uh, and I still think so. You know, because the pattern in world history is not convergence. The pattern is sustained divergence, and there's very different types of political equilibria in parts of the world where the state dominates society or society dominates the state. And hey, presto, you know, what have you seen since the collapse of the Berlin Wall, not convergence, you've actually seen long run historical divergence kind of reasserting itself. You know, what about Russia? You know, that Russia always was outside of this European equilibrium. Russia was never part of the Carolingian Empire. It always had a very different dynamics, much more where the state was much more dominant over society. And it's actually that low frequency aspect that's reasserted itself after the fall of Berlin Wall. It's quite the opposite to convergence. So I think that's just to end with a sort of little flavor of, you know, what you can use that theory to think about. 
and you know, like it's hard to. I feel you know, you're 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 probably all too young to know who Monty Python's Flying Circus is, you know. But there's a famous sketch of where they have to recite Proust, the whole of Remembrance of Things Past in like a minute, you know. So I, I sort of I'm having a Remembrance of Things Past in a minute moment. But there you are, just just a flavor of what it's about. And now I'll shut up. Thank you very very much for that. So one thing you touched on quite a lot is how history, how important history is in influencing these political models. So, you know, China being historically Confucian, England being influenced by the Anglo-Saxon Witten and then Magna Carta. Um, do you think these sorts of political models and, structure, and, and structures need to develop and evolve organically? Or do you think they can sort of be established intentionally, sort of top down? Well, I think I think both. You know, I think I think what we know about the Chinese case is it's 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 almost like a sort of intellectual revolution, you know, in some sense that 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 establishes that establishes that this model. Uh, but I think we also know, you know, if you think about Benedict Anderson's work on nationalism, you know, his work was really emphasizing a much more bottom up kind of organic. You know, it wasn't the state that created like the. I mean, this is. This is, you know, national identity, maybe not exactly the same thing, but I'm just giving you another example where something very important for politics can emerge in a very, very bottom up way. You know, it wasn't the English state that created an English identity, you know, it just sort of emerged from social interactions and, you know, capitalism and the printing press. I mean, there's lots of hypotheses about that, but I do, I, you know, I think it can happen. I think it can happen top down and, and sort of bottom up, you know, these equilibria can get established in different ways. Uh, So, unsurprisingly, one thing that a lot of people want to ask about is coronavirus. And I think that could relate to some of the things you were talking about, because obviously one of the things that you, you do is, is you compare these quite disparate structures, so, you know, Yemen and China, um, and, and so on. How useful do you think the pandemic is in being a sort of control as something that's sort of equally applicable to all of these different um, structures? what information do you think we sort of future economic historians could derive from it? Yeah, I mean, what I find very interesting about the whole pandemic is, is it's a very Hobbesian moment, isn't it? You know, it's sort of like when it's, you, you know, you become very lexicographic if you know any economic, if you know economic theory. It's just like one thing that matters more than anything else, you know, like health, security, you know, you just, and, and what, what, what's fascinating is, you know, as Hobbes talked about, is you kind of, you want the state to do something, you know, you want the, want the state to kind of come. And so it's a moment where the state gets a lot of freedom to acquire new tasks and authority. And, you know, I think that's a very dangerous moment, we'd say, in the, in the terms of the, in the thesis, because I guess our view is that it's just in the nature of the state to kind of want to control and want, you know, to take on things. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a hypothesis one could debate, but that's the way we think about it in the book. And so you, you've given the state an enormous opportunity to get stronger over society. So to me, the big challenge is, is how can that happen in a way that you can control it? I mean, you know, what you see in the United States is an, there's an enormous conflict at the moment because in the US, there's a, just a deep antagonism towards the state and a distrust of the state, which has only been getting worse and worse and worse. You know, what was it Ronald Reagan said that um, the nine most frightening words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help you. Except, you know, that's been driven into Americans, you know, for long, longer than before Ronald Reagan, but it's got worse and worse and worse over the last 40 years. So, we're at a moment with sort of historically low levels of trust in the state in the United States, but now we desperately need the state and it's, it's creating all, you know, you know, you're sitting in England, you can see it. It's creating all of this kind of disequilibrium at the moment, this business of do we open up and, and, and they haven't found, we haven't found a way here in the U S of building sort of simultaneously making the state stronger and, building trust in it and finding new mechanisms for controlling it and giving people ownership in, in all these strategies, you know? And, and so, so I would say the big picture in terms of the book is that, you know, uh, it makes authoritarian systems look good. You know, look at Vietnam, for example, there's what, 300 cases in Vietnam with hundred million people. Uh, but I think the big picture is that authoritarian systems may be good in very, 
particular dimensions. But the big picture is that, you know, societies like that are not good at generating sustained standards of living, you know, sustained improvements in living standards. And, you know, they're not good at stimulating, you know, what we call liberty in the book, you know, political liberty, you know, kind of Lockean liberty. Uh, we, you know, we, we have a very traditional notion of liberty. We use the definition in Locke's second treatise of government. So, so, so I see it as a very dangerous moment. You know, there's a lot of path dependence in the world. It's a moment of, in, you know, it's a unique moment of crisis where the world could verge much more towards political systems where state, the state dominates society, you know, and I, I, and, I, and I think in the US, it's just very, it's a very nerve wracking moment, uh, speaking personally, I find it very nerve wracking. Yeah. I mean, it's fascinating as a social scientist, but nerve wracking as a human being. Um, do you think that Western countries have become more extractive in recent years or the institutions in Western countries? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I, I mean, I think there's a lot of problems. You know, I think that, uh, I think the rise in, I think, I think the answer to that is probably not, but I think there's an enormous danger that that could happen. You know, I think if you look at this rise in this unprecedented rise in inequality, I think that's mostly driven by, you know, by technical change, by globalization. Of course, it's, it's also driven by institutional change, by deunionization. Uh, you know, that's, creating enormous inequity, you know, in the economic sphere, but also the political sphere. This money spills over into politics. And, you know, that's clearly connected to, you know, this immense polarization of politics, you see. I mean, I'm talking about the United States. You know, I have, I have several modes. You know, I'm, I'm English, but, 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 but I left England a long time ago, so I'm not sure I understand English politics very well. But, you know, and most of my research is in Africa or Latin America. So I could talk about Colombia, you know, or Congo or the US, you know, I don't know if any of that, you know, is useful, but, but I, I, you know, I'm talking about the US. If you want me to stop talking about the US, I could stop talking about the US and talk about something else, you know, but, but, but what you see here is this incredible polarization, which is, con which is clearly connected, you know, like, so for example, Larry Bartels, who's a political scientist at Princeton, he has this research showing that if you look at the, the policy preferences of senators, they're much closer to what rich people prefer than like the median voter or like the average citizenship. So, so the money, you know, co-ops the political system. You know, I think you see the rise of kind of massive imperfections of competition, of monopsony and labor markets. You know, look at this stagnation of median wages in the US over the past 20, 30 years. So, so I think that's, that's, that could be the run up to a very different type, much more extractive uh, set of institutions. I think economic institutions are clearly becoming more extractive, you know, in this way I'm describing like imperfections in competition. And, you know, in the book, we give this example of, you know, Bill Gates, you know, Bill Gates being dragged in front of antitrust authorities and Microsoft being prosecuted for, uh, you know, violating the Sherman Act. And we make this comparison between him and Carlos Slim and say, well, you know, this could never happen in Mexico. It's like unbelievable. This is just impossible to conceive of in Mexico. But I, want, I worry that that's also impossible to conceive of the US now, that this couldn't happen to Jeff Bezos or, or Zuckerberg. It just, they have it, they can manage that now. Bill Gates couldn't manage it, you know, but, but now it can be managed. And that's the sort of sign of of this institution deteriorating, a deterioration that you're, you're asking about, yes. I'm, I'm interested that you touched on that example because of course, Bill Gates thought you're being a bit unfair there in, in, uh, on Carlos Slim, I think, um, in his review of why nations fail. Do you have a sort of response to him on that? I'm not, I'm not sure Bill Gates understood the point actually, or his staffer who wrote the review understood the point, you know. I mean, I think it's very well established that Carlos Slim got his monopoly, you know, through his political connections. Uh, and, you know, and the, and, the, and the telecoms was privatized to him basically without any regulation of pricing. And, you know, there's, there's, there's some very conservative calculations by the OECD about the costs of this, and it's absolutely whopping. I mean, so, 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 you know, everything we said is just very well established. I mean, there's nothing original there. It's very well established by Mexican journalists and commentators and, um, you know, so I, 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 I think he was confused, honestly. I mean, he's a busy chap, you know. Yes, I, I did think it was slightly strange, actually, that point. Uh, <laughs> for, on his part. Um, 
One thing that interested me about your the, 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 the narrow corridor table um, was that, if I interpreted it correctly, you have the power of the state in Western Europe and North America sort of higher than in China. Um, why is that? Yeah, so that's, that's a great question. I mean, that's actually, you know, we have a mathematical, those of you who like differential equations, we actually have a model of this, you know, and that's a theorem in the model, you know, where, and, and the idea is exactly that, you know, there's a sort of competition. There's a competition between state and society. And so, you know, they're competing with each other. The state is trying to control society. Society is trying to control the state. And but in that competition, that sort of struggle, they both get stronger. Whereas, you know, if the state dominates society, then what happens? Then society just gets too far behind and it gives up. And then the state, the society is not pushing the state. So the state gives up too. And, and the other way around. So that's the kind of intuition in the mathematical model as to why you get in the corridor, you get this situation where the state and society are stronger. There's, there's a marvelous book that we talk about uh, by Charles Tilly, the political sociologist. It's a book called Popular Contention in Great Britain which is, you know, he's looking at British politics and also sort of collective action between the middle of the 18th century and the first reform act in 1832. And he describes exactly this, you know, the modern state, they create, you know, for the first time after the glorious revolution in England, they create this fiscal system, these excise tax collectors are kind of in your face everywhere. And then society reacts to this and starts organizing. And, and he traces the, the change in the way society organized and in which collective action took place and what people complained about. People complained about different things and they acted in a kind of broader way and they complained to different people. And, and so that's exactly what we have in mind, that this, there's this sort of competition makes you both stronger. You know, you could say that's an empirical, that's an empirical, you know, that's an empirical claim. Uh, uh, but yeah, that's, that's, that's one of the most interesting pieces of the book, I think. Um, could I ask you a question very briefly? I've got an exam on why nations fail in about two weeks time. Um, okay. And so I wondered if I could put a very, very quick question to you about that. Um, and that is, um, in your definition of inclusive political institutions in that book, you say that they have to be sufficiently pluralistic. Um, and I wondered what you might mean by that more specifically in terms of um, you give 19th century Britain as an example of um, a kind of set of inclusive political institutions leading to incredible growth and, and so forth. But in that society, women didn't have the franchise and actually there was quite limited kind of democratic engagement. How does that kind of fit no. with your sense of, of inclusivity? I think, I think one of the things that's nice about the new book relative to why nations fail is that this model, you know, I showed you that sort of phase diagram, it, it gives much more of a sense that this is a process, you know. So, so the problem with why nations fail is that it sort of comes across too much as though you sort of make this, it's like zero or one, you know, you, you're extractive or you're inclusive, and then you make this transition from being extractive to being inclusive. But the reality is, it's much more gradual, the process. And that, that's, I think, so that's one thing we're really happy about the new book as well, that it, 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 it captures that. And I think that's exactly what you're talking about, that, that, you know, it could be that, you know, relative to how you think about British society today, you know, there were all sorts of non-inclusive elements about 19th century Britain. It was much more inclusive than it had been in the 18th century. And it was probably much more inclusive than most other parts of the world. But you're right that by some absolute standard, it, there were many elements of, you know, lack of inclusion. And I, you know, I think, you know, when you're thinking about economic growth in some sense, you know, it's just, you have to be sufficiently inclusive. You know, if you think about, about our discussion of the U.S., you know, th think about the discussion of the U.S. South. The U.S. South was extremely extractive. You know, 50% of the population of the U.S. South were slaves. You know, that was a canonical extractive economy. You know, and the South was poorer. You know, the South was less urbanized. It had less industry. It had less infrastructure, canals, roads, public goods. You know, it was a lot poorer than the North. But, but it was the inclusive part of the U.S. that kind of, drove the economy along. So, so despite this extractive thing in the South, and you know, I think that's, that's the same with 19th century Britain, you could say, despite the fact that there was, you know, women didn't have proper property rights, you know, they were disenfranchised, that was an economic cost. There was enough inclusion to have innovation and to get things going, you know, and you know, I think if you read the new book, he said shamelessly, you know, promoting it yet again, we actually tried to bring in this discussion of 
women's empowerment and women's, you know, women's enfranchisement and also, you know, just economic empowerment, you know, about Caroline Norton and, you know, and so, so I think there's probably not enough of that, but, 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 um, you know, uh, it's a good point. Yeah. I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah. But, but, um, yeah. Send me your exam questions. Yeah. <laughs> um, so perhaps on the other end, um, obviously Western societies might have quite inclusive institutions, say perhaps the US and the UK, but might be struggling with uh, stagnated uh, prosperity, productivity and wage growth. Um, how does your work help us plot the course um, once uh, urban economy develops rather than just explain its rise? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think you, you, know, you, don't, you don't expect the US or Britain or Germany to be growing at 10% a year. You know, that's what the economists would call catch-up catch up growth. You know, China, whatever, was a very poor, technologically backward country in 1978. So, of course, it can grow very fast by, by adopting technologies from overseas and reallocating labor. And, you know, and I, you know, I, you know, I think, I think every economist would sort of agree this is about, this is about innovation, you know, it's about new technologies, new ideas. And, you know, to me, you know, why, you know, this, we use this word inclusion. And, you know, I think that word is that that's very important, you know, the word inclusion, because, because, you know, and this is what the empirical evidence shows, you know, we discussed this you know, this research by, by the economic historians Ken Sokolov and Zarina Khan, which I love, about patentees. You know, who, who files patents? Like, to me, you know, the biggest concern I have about the U.S. nowadays is that that's becoming more and more oligarchized. You know, patent, it's harder to look at patents nowadays because so many of them are kind of corporate. But, but if you ask, like, you know, in the 19th century, which is where Sokolov and Khan looked at, you know, who's patenting, what you see is that People with ideas, you know, creativity, projects, dreams, you know, that they come, they're everywhere in society. You know, you don't know where they are. You know, you have to create a set of institutions that allows a society to tap into all that latent talent, you know. And I think that's what inclusive societies do. That's what generates technology, new ideas, total factor productivity growth, you know, if you know something about growth accounting. And, and, I, so that's that's the same that's the thing you know it's the same thing you know that's what china did it's i think it's the same thing that creates catch up growth that creates growth once you're at the world sort of world technology frontier it's allowing talent to come out you know allowing people to get an education to get a loan you know to start a business to write contracts to you know and every extractive society there's enormous barriers to talent and innovation and people are trapped, you know, like I, you know, I work a lot in Africa, in Congo and Nigeria and Sierra Leone. And, you know, if people ask me, you know, what's the biggest problem in Congo? I say wasted talent. You know, you meet these people that are just like so clever and just entrepreneurial, but they're trapped, you know, they're trapped in Kananga or they're trapped in Kisangani and they can't, they can't get out. They can't get an education. They, you know, they're just, there's no mobility, you know, and, and, and so I think that's, it's the same thing. Yeah. And then following on from that, Danny asks, um, do you think that there's a chance we might be coming to the end of continuous real economic growth and that the sort of last two centuries uh, were a bit of a blip in human history? I think it's entirely possible. Yeah, I mean, Asimoglu has this thousand page book on, on, you know, introduction to modern economic growth, which is all of these kind of mathematical models of growth. And, you know, he has this sort of triumphalist introduction of like, oh, modern, what economic historians call modern economic growth, there's the industrial revolution, there's James Watt and the steam engine, you know, you, you know, you know, and, and then this idea that somehow technology, you know, technological change will just go on forever you know, I said, like, but don't you think, like, every society in human history thought they'd, like, cracked all the problems that had held back? The Mayas, you know, the Mayas were probably sitting around in Palenque, kind of congratulating themselves on, like, what a successful society they created. And then, you know, 100 years later, it collapsed. You know, the Romans, the Greeks, everybody, the ancient Egyptians, you know, Ramesses II. So, you know, it's a very ahistorical, I criticize him because this is like a super ahistorical 
perspective. You know, we I think we're very aware of <laughs> the constraints. You know, all of the negative externalities we're creating. You know, for the climate. You know, uh, global warming. You know, that's going to have profound effects on human welfare and productivity. And you know, and just like with coronavirus, we kind of see oh gosh, you know, maybe we need to go to a very different way of doing things. Like we, we still haven't got it with climate change and global warming, it seems to me. We still haven't got that we need to do things differently. You know, we need to organize things differently in a sustained way. We all have our heads, you know, in the sand, basically. And look at this, it's going to take the same thing. It's going to take the same thing. To, it's going to take something disastrous to happen to, uh, to get our head out of the sand. And you know, maybe after that, we'll wake up and we'll see a very different future. So I think that's entirely possible, yes. Um, you, you touched on some disagreements you have with um, Darren Asimoglu there. Um, are there any other issues you disagree with each other on? And has that ever Ooh, academic collaboration? That. Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we, you know, we've been friends for, all, for 28 years. You know, we've been working together for 27 and, uh, uh, yeah, we disagree about stuff all the time. You know, I think like, you know, you have to endlessly challenge yourself in academia. It's so easy to get in your silo and feel kind of comfortable about all your successes. But so, so we just try to focus on things that we don't understand, you know, and, and there's a lot of those. I mean, I think, you know, at some fundamental level, we really don't understand issue, many issues of development. You know, I've been working for the last couple of years in Haiti, you know, and every time I go to Port-au-Prince, I just like, it's so, it's just such a mess, you know, and I, like, and I can describe it in terms of human capital or physical capital, and I could talk about institutions and the political system and, and property rights or corruption, but I, at some level, I just, I don't understand why the society kind of works like that. You know, I can write models down and I can write books, but I just, you know, and I, this is why I like working in Africa so much, because it just challenges your, your understanding of what goes on in the world. And, and, you know, and I think that's what you have to do to sort of stay creative, just pose new puzzles. So we're, all, we're endlessly disagreeing. We're having a big disagreement at the moment, actually, about this project that I'd like to do in Africa that he thinks is nonsense, you know. But, but I'm, 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 I'm wearing him down. I'm stubborn. Oh. That's, a, you know, that's a very good trait for a researcher. Um, Danny asks again uh, that given the, the push of development economics to the forefront um, with the Nobel Prize last year, uh, where do you think the field and specifically the prize itself is going this year and in the future? Oh gosh, I wouldn't have a clue about that. I have absolutely no insight how, into how those decisions are made. I mean, I find that, I mean, I, you know, they're all friends of mine, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, delighted for them you know i have like big disagreements with them about the agenda and you know their agenda is very different from mine but you know but they all have deserved it and they've had a huge impact you know and i you know i don't think one could possibly dispute that but I, I i honestly have no i mean i just look around the economics profession and i see you know so many distinguished scholars you know who haven't had the nobel prize you know like ariel rubinstein for example who invented modern non-cooperative bargaining theory like i would have thought giving him the nobel prize was the biggest slam dunk of all time you know all of the people uh like you know josh angrist and you know who invented this modern causal identification you know again i'm i'm I remember that because when I was a graduate student nobody understood that you know nobody understood this whole issue of like causal inference and then suddenly like the penny dropped you know and people woke up and sort of said it's like one of those far side cartoons you know where the cows wake up and say oh my gosh you know we've been eating grass all these years we've been eating grass so, and so so that you know so they obviously you know I, but honestly I have no idea how on earth you decide that or why why did they give it you know to people who were much younger than they normally give it to, you know, when there's so many, you know, so many distinguished scholars uh, who, you know, it's just, I wouldn't like to be on that committee, I have to say, you know. Uh, um, so I, I'm not sure I can provide any insight whatsoever into that. Um, given that why nations fail and the narrow corridor are concerned primarily with political and economic institutions, um, what, what place do you think there is for studying 
things like, um, and so, sorry, this is a question from someone else, I think, so I, might, I may not be doing it justice, um, but for things like culture, geography, um, national identity, religion, um, and I, the question concludes, do, do you have any particular works by other authors um, who look more at these sorts of phenomena um, that you recommend as, as being sort of supplementary to um, your work? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think, yeah, I think, I think there's so much work to do. You know, if you ask me, I mean, I always, if you ask me, like, for example, this is completely outside the scope of, of, of you know, either of our books. But if you ask me, you know, why is it that China is uh, so successful? I'm actually going to, I'm giving a talk tomorrow about Africa, about like why you should be optimistic about economic development in Africa. And my arguments are all are basically kind of sociological. You know, there's aspects of African society, the way African society works that are actually very conducive to economic development. You know, if you could just get a few things in place, you know, think about China, you know, in 1978, China had had a really bad 200 years. You know, by the second half of the 18th century, the Qing state was falling apart. The fiscal system was kind of withering away. The Grand Canal silted up. There was like mass corruption, the granary system. Then the 19th century, there was civil war. There was the opium, you know, it was like 200 years of chaos. And then, you know, Deng Xiaoping, sort of sorts out a few things at the top and bang, you know, the growth rate goes to 10% a year. Like, why is that? Because underneath that, there were aspects of Chinese society that were very conducive to entrepreneurship and economic growth. And what do we mean by that? I think that's at the level of norms. You know, it's at the level of, you know, I talked about Confucius, but like this notion of meritocracy, you know, Confucius said, promote the worthy, you know, so this notion in China of rewarding talent and merit, you know, I, you know, at the University of Chicago, there's just thousands and thousands of Chinese students. If you ask, you know, where are they from? I always like try to ask people where they're from. Do you see they're from all over the place in China? You know, like there's just this ability for talent to get to the top. Compare that to India, you know, to India. You know, there's a billion Indians. GDP per capita is lower. You have to normalize in the right way. There's far fewer Indian students here. And if you talk to them, they're all Brahmins, you know, they're all higher caste, you know, there's nothing like that in China. So how do you think about that? That's a sort of sociological difference. Uh, maybe that's cultural, uh, you know, I'm, you know I'm, I'm not sure I have the right terms to talk about that. But, you know, if you, study, if you think about African society, African society is totally different from Indian society or Chinese society. And, and, and I, you know, I, I, you know, I always give the example when I teach. My wife is from Colombia in South America, in Latin America. A few years ago, we were at a wedding in Cali in the south of Colombia. It's a very kind of elitist place, sugar plantations. So we get into the party and this woman comes up to my wife, you know, who's from Bogota and says, in Spanish, you know, like, oh, what school did you go to? <laughs> like, if you're, you know, are you a person that's worth talking to? Now, I could tell you that would never happen in a wedding in Africa. If you went to a wedding in Africa, everyone would come and hug you, call you sister, you know, they'd be your friend. They, it's like, what's that? You know, maybe that's cultural, it's sociological, it's, but I actually think things like that, I'm trying to study things like that in Africa at the moment, actually. I think that's, extremely important for kind of understanding economic dynamics and, and political dynamics. And so I do think, you know, I think, you know, I, I guess that a lot of my career is, you know, I started out as an economist and I kind of understood that what I was interested in couldn't be explained by, by the elements that were in the economic theory I was being taught. So I tried to look for what else needs to go in there, you know, politics, institutions, and, 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 and you know, the use of this word culture is sort of contentious. Uh, but geography, forget geography. I, you know, I, geography, you know, I don't like these geographical theories. So, so I think culture is interesting, depends what you, how you conceptualize it and what you focus on, but forget about geography. Um, could you expand on that potentially a little bit? The, your critique of Jared Diamond's book is, quite cutting at the start of why nations fail so could you potentially expand yeah. on that you know i mean i'm you know i'm a very good friend of jared diamond i think jared jared is absolutely wonderful i edited a book with him i organized all these conferences with him he, he's just a remarkable scholar uh just so curious and intellectually energetic i mean i just you know he's my role model uh, but i just fundamentally disagree with that idea. You know, I think the history of humanity is not about succumbing to geographical constraints. It's about overcoming them. You know, like 
think about humans. You know, humans evolved in like East Africa and they spread all over the world. And, you know, but when ants did that, ants speciate, you know, ants get into different environments and then they speciate. Humans got to Greenland and what did they do? They developed a taste for, you know, for walrus blubber and invented the igloo, you know, and ice fishing. And that's human creativity and innovation. And I, so I just don't see this idea, you know, like a lot of the work that Asimoglu and I did early on, you know, was trying to show that this Jeff Sachs's version of like geography was just nonsense. You know, I just, I just, it's not, it's kind of nonsense empirically. And it just, just can't be the right way to think about these problems of African development, I don't think. You know, like if Norway was a poor country, we'd find it very easy to come up with geographical explanations for why Norway was poor. You know, so I just think that there are these correlations, but it's not really a, it's not really an issue of causality. And, you know, I think, you know, but again, you know, th there are things that, you know, serious people could disagree with. You know, Jared would say, Africa is poor because, you know, because it was isolated and technology couldn't diffuse and, you know, there were too few animal and crop species. So that's, that's, you know, that's really not the way I think about Africa. I think Africa historically got into a very different kind of institutional equilibria. And, you know, and it's not, it's not something pinned down. I don't think difference in human societies is pinned down by by geography. You know, the way China ended up with Lord Shang and Confucius, that wasn't geography that determined that. And it wasn't geography that determined that this very different type of equilibria would appear. That's human creativity, it's innovation, it's new ideas, ways of doing things, ways of organizing society, technology, things spread, things diffuse. You know, I, I how long do we have, you know? So much to say, but I, you know, but Guns, Germs and Steel, you know, I, I, I it's an absolutely fabulous book. If, if only I could write a book as good as that, you know, I'd die happy. Um, could you perhaps discuss how, this is again from Keir who asked a question earlier. Um, could you, uh, um, how did Imperial Germany's industrialization uh, tally with a theory of democratic engagement being important for prosperity? Um, was it just international factors? Um... Well, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think so there's quite a bit of discussion of Germany in the new book. You know, I think Germany, the German case is sort of interesting, of course, because, you know, if you think about the Franks, who were the Franks? You know, the Franks were, were Germans, basically, you know, they were from beyond the Rhine. Uh, so, 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 you know, so, so, and if you go back and think about the history of Germany, you know, and, and the Carolingian Empire and the Holy Roman Empire, you know, that's, we'd say that's in the corridor, you know, that's in the corridor. Uh, but obviously there's shocks and, you know, society can get pushed out of the corridor. You know, the Thirty Years' War, in some sense, in the 17th century, pushed many societies out of the corridor. You know, after the Thirty Years' War, you, you get this absolutist state building project emerges in Prussia. And many of these more participatory institutions go into reverse. But what I find interesting, you know, you could go through German history and think about, you know, we talk about Weimar and the collapse of Weimar and the Nazi state. And, you know, so, so you could say it's a kind of bumpy ride in the corridor. You know, our view, in my view of the world is, is, you know, like developing inclusive institutions is not some sort of, it's not some social planning problem. It's, it's not some consensual thing. People get together in Philadelphia and they come up with some, no, it's you have to fight for your right to party. You know, you're all too young to know what that reference is to. So, so, so you have, it's a struggle. You know, it's a struggle. It's an equilibrium outcome. And, and so, so I would say, you know, that, you know, we, we were talking earlier about was the U.S. lurching out of the corridor, you know, and I think it's that, that, that there's many challenges, you know, which, which can push you in that direction. And I think Germany is a great example of that. But I think the big picture would be, you know, in the 19th century, you know, there was still a lot of inclusion in Germany. You know, after the, you know, after the collapse at Jena, you have this Stein-Hardenberg reforms, you have the end of serfdom, you know, many of these participatory institutions, for example, in Prussia, that kind of went into mothballs in the 17th century, bounce back with a vengeance. You know, after 1848, you have, you know, you have a Reichstag with universal male suffrage. There's lots of restrictions on, you know, what they can do, you know, because there's the Kaiser and everything, but there's still large elements of inclusion. So I, I would think of the German case as, as, you know, broadly fitting into this 
this, this idea of being in the corridor and its institutions becoming more inclusive over time, you know, getting rid of serfdom. Again, you know, again, that's a nice example of it's a process, you know, so, so it's a process and it takes, it takes time. And I think, you know, we do much more justice to that. And, you know, the Nazi state, what I find interesting about the Nazi, I mean, there's many things interesting about the Nazi state, but, but what, what, what I find fascinating, I don't really have an explanation for this, but, you know, as a social scientist, is that, you know, like, once you're in the corridor, there, there is some kind of consensus emerges in society of, like, how you do things, you know. So, so when the Nazi state collapses, the Germans get back together and they have some idea of, how do we organize things? You know, that's the sort of thing that you don't have in Congo. You know, there's no, there's never been any consensus of how you organize anything in Congo. Like, so, so then it's just very difficult to get agreement over anything, how you're going to do anything, how you're going to allocate responsibilities and authority. But the Germans do that. You know, the Nazi state collapses and they get back and they write a constitution and they, they get right back in the corridor. Of course, you know, they're only out of the corridor for 15 years, but you know, what does that show you? It shows that being out of the corridor for 15 years can, can, can create enormous social consequences and disastrous uh, costs and mayhem. So, 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 so but, but, you know, but again, you know, we're sort of focused on these very low frequency, I guess, long run dynamics and, and, you know, and, and uh, I'm not sure that answered your question, but, I, but I think, I think that, you know, I would say the German case fits within there's quite a lot of discussion of it in the book and it, it kind of fits within the bigger picture. I mean, that would be my argument. Okay, thank you very much for your time. We'll just move on to some quick fire questions that we ask all our speakers. Okay. So I'm gonna start with something that might be slightly confusing. Um, we have a social event tomorrow called Spirited Discussions where we're gonna be discussing all sorts of absolutely ridiculous motions and uh, drinking uh, liberally. And we thought we might ask those motions to you. So the motions we'll be discussing tomorrow will be, this house would abolish private schools. This house believes the House of Lords should be fully elected. And this house believes Eurovision is the most liberal televised competition. So I was wondering if you could comment on those. Yeah, private schools. <laughs> uh, I don't know, I mean, this is not going to be a very good answer, but let you know. Let me go back to my uh, my statement before that we really don't understand, you know, in some fundamental way, um, social social equilibria. You know, Britain's a very weird thing. You know, I've been doing this research on the enclosure of the British Commons. You know, the the you know you probably all know about the enclosure movement, and so I've been studying these parliamentary enclosures, and it's like absolutely fascinating, like. How, how, you know, under what circumstances could a parish get enclosed? Well, if the people who owned three quarters or maybe four fifths of the land were in favor. So where does that number come from? Nobody ever wrote it down. It was just sort of understood that this was, this was the proper thing to do. You know, there's this kind of really weird element of informality in British society and British Politics. I don't know if you ever read George Orwell's essay, The Lion and the Unicorn. It's very funny on this, you know. So why do I say that, thinking about the House of Lords? Well, there's this element of tradition, you know, and we don't really understand how it makes the equilibria hung to get hang together. So I, I'm always a little nervous about radical change when we don't really understand how an equilibria hangs together because you're in danger of eliminating something that's critical, but you just don't understand it, you know? So, 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 so you know, and, and from my perspective, you know, someone who studies Haiti or Congo, you know, the, the British equilibrium is like a very, very functional one, you know? So, 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 so I would say, you know, yet yeah, there's, you know, of course, you're talking about social mobility and inclusion, you're, desperately worried about schools and you know access to schools and you know improving the quality of public schools you know but but the private schools are an ancient institution in Britain and I didn't go to one myself you know I went to a grammar school and you know and and but but I you know I'm happy not to abolish them I probably wouldn't send my children to one but I'm happy not to abolish them because that's part of the equilibrium, you know, and, and it's a pretty functional equilibrium by world historical standards, I'd say. You know, I'm not opposed to reform, far from it, 
but but you know you're you're identifying things whose role in society I don't fully understand I'd say you know so 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 I think the House of Lords is a clearer example and what was your last question about um it was about it was about Eurovision uh whether it was the most Eurovision liberal, Song Contest the Eurovision Song Contest I see you and you're arguing that's a very inclusive institution I guess so. The, 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 the motion to these events that often don't make a huge amount of sense. It's, this House believes Eurovision is the most liberal televised competition. No idea what the answer to that is. Yeah. Don't they have It's a Knockout anymore? I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I've been away too long. I wouldn't, you're asking the wrong person. Yeah. Um, Sorry. Well, thank you very much your time it's been an absolute pleasure to have you um and thank you for your very detailed answers on a huge range of topics my my pleasure yes yes my pleasure i hope we all get a chance to meet in person sometime and uh, after all this nuttiness is over but perhaps it would be i don't know yeah, yeah. okay thank you. thank you yeah